نور على مر الزمان تألقا وأضاء للدنيا طريقا مشرقا وهدى من الرحمن يهدينا به الصالحات وللمكارم والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد uh, welcome my dear respected brothers and sisters uh, to what will be inshallah the first of a two week series pertaining to a topic which many of us I'm sure are familiar with and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to place a lot of benefit uh, in this series so inshallah ta'ala from now on every single Friday night hopefully uh, we will be having a lesson a general lesson and the last Friday of every month will be at Belmo inshallah ta'ala with myself and uh, our dear Sheikh Faiz uh, for those brothers who need to sit on a chair, it's not a problem. There's a lot of chairs at the back uh, which you can sit on, inshallah ta'ala. It's not rude. Uh, it's a general lesson, so I have no problem with anyone having to sit on a chair if you guys uh, want. The story of Abu Sufyan and Heraclius, my brothers, is a story which, like I said, is known to many of us. Is known to many of us. And it's a story about two, or what were two disbelievers, giving testimonial evidence to certain characteristics of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and this hadith is collected or narrated 12 times in Sahih al-Bukhari, 12 different times. Three of those times the narration is mentioned at length. It's a complete narration, a very long narration, and three of those times it's mentioned in complete length. The other nine times or eight times it's mentioned in a bit of a summarized uh, version. So inshallah ta'ala we're going to take a uh, semi-lengthy one. And we're going to be going through this narration over the next two weeks, uh, sentence by uh, sentence. And subhanallah, wallahi, this narration, it helps the Muslim get closer to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, some people, for example, they are close to each other. They're close to their brothers. They love their brothers, etc. From spending a lot of time with them. The way we spend our time with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is through the Quran and through the sunnah. By learning about him, learning about what he loved, learning about what he hated, learning about what he did, learning about how he did those things, etc. So like I said, inshallah ta'ala, with this narration that is collected in Al-Bukhari, the narration of Abu Sufyan, the story between Abu Sufyan and Heraclius, we're going to inshallah learn a bit more about this Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And wallahi, I say with an open heart, it is very, very important for us to understand who our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is. You know, naturally, uh, if one of you, for example, want to get your wives a cocktail or something, so you go, you know, to whatever cocktail shop, you have to be careful what you get. Uh, so you don't hear a mouthful, for example. You got to know, does she like honey? Does she like it without honey? Uh, does she like it with honey? Does she like it without honey? Does she want it with ashtar, without ashtar? Nuts, no nuts. Cream, no cream, etc., etc., etc. Why? Why? So that you don't upset her because you care about her out of love for her. And likewise, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is more beloved to us than our own selves, it's extremely important we learn about his life, his likes and dislikes, so that we can do what pleases him, so that we can please Allah azza wa jal, and we can stay away from what displeases him, so we do not displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that we do not displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a reason the companions, they loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so much. They lived with him. They ate with him. They drank with him. They slept with him. They traveled with him. They breathed with him. And that is one of the reasons they would go to the end of the world just to fulfill his command. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would command something or would order something, they would go to the end of the world to fulfill this order. They would race one another just so they can be the first to fulfill his order. There's a reason that the companions, they would try their best to get whatever remnants off of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a blessed man. His sweat, his hair, his remnants. He's everything to the extent in Sahih al-Bukhari it's mentioned in a long narration. إِذَا تَنَخَّمَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ نُخَامَةً فَيَتَسَابَقُ الْقُلُّ لِيَأْخُذَهَا 
فإذا وقعت في يد أحد منهم دلك بها وجهه وجسده. To this extent, what does the narration say? It says that if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had phlegm come out, or a snot, mucus, nasal secretions, the companions would yatasabakun. They would race one another just to get whatever they could from this. And if it fell into their hands or they got a hold of this, they would start to wipe their faces and their bodies with it. Yani there's a reason the Prophet وسلم, was held in such high esteem and high regards to them. Because they knew who he وسلم, was. So if we do not learn who the Prophet وسلم, is, logically, we will never hold him in the position which he deserves to be held in our hearts. To the extent the Prophet وسلم, himself said, the most beloved of my ummah to me are a people who will come after me and they will desire so much to see me. They will be so keen to see me, just to see. Doesn't say to talk, doesn't say to sit with, doesn't say to eat with, just to see a glimpse of the Prophet وسلم, he says they will basically give up their wealth and their families just for this one instance. And these are the most beloved people of the nation of the Prophet ﷺ. So the hadith we're going to go through, as we mentioned 12 times in Sahih al-Bukhari, and we're going to mention a semi, inshallah, lengthy one, and we're going to be going through sentence by sentence over the next two weeks. And as everybody who knows this narration knows, this is a narration that can be given in an hour, and this is a narration that can be given in 10, 20, 30 lessons, wallahi. If you really want to contemplate upon the meanings, it can be given in so many lessons that we will take so many and extract so many benefits from. Now the narration obviously is narrated by Abu Sufyan, Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, who became a Muslim eight years after the Hijrah. So when this instance happened to him, he was still a disbeliever. And that is what I said or meant by it is two testimonial evidences by two disbelievers about the characteristic of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this etiquette with him, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of learning, this could have been the reason. This could have been the reason for the good deeds of certain companions to be completely rendered invalid. There's a narration also in Al-Bukhari where Nafi' narrates by Ibn Mulaika, that he says, Ibn Abi Mulaika, he says, The two pious ones, or the two best ones, they were almost doomed, doomed, finished. They were about to perish. Who are they? Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Upon hearing this, you may think, why would they, why would they be doomed? These are the two best men. To walk on the face of this earth after the prophets and the messengers. So why would they be doomed? What would cause them to perish? It wasn't zina. It wasn't even shirk in regards to this specific instance. It wasn't killing. It wasn't stealing. But rather it revolved around etiquettes. etiquettes. For when a delegation of Banu Tamim came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he wanted to appoint a leader for them. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he said, appoint this individual. And Umar radiallahu anhu said, no, appoint this individual. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he turned to Umar and he said, ma aratta illa khilafi, that you do not want except to contradict me. So Abu Bakr says, ma arattu khilafat. That's not what it is. I don't want to contradict you. But basically, in brackets, I think this person is more deserving. So their voices started to go on top of one another. They're human beings. Then Allah Azza wa Jal from above the heavens, He sent down the verses at the start of Surah al Hujurat, the second verse. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. O you who believe, do not raise your voices. Above the voice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَلَا تَجْهَرُوا لَهُ بِالْقَوْلِ كَجَهْرِ بَعْدِكُمْ لِبَعْضِ أَنْ تَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ 
and basically don't speak to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the way you speak to others with a loud tone. Why? The consequence of this action? Lest your deeds be rendered invalid. Everything you did be rendered a zero, null, void, invalid without you even knowing. And this is why Ibn Abi Mulaika, he says, The two best or the two pious ones, they were about to be doomed because of this action. And the scholars, they say, we see, raising the voice over the voice of the Prophet wasallam after his death by raising your voice over a hadith when it is narrated. When there is a hadith of the Prophet wasallam narrated, and some individuals, they raise their voices over this hadith. Some of the scholars, they said, this is what we see as raising your voice over the Prophet wasallam's after his death. Now, before we get into this story of Abu Sufyan and Heraclius, it's extremely important to understand the background. Heraclius, it's not the same Hercules as some brothers, you know, every time they saw, I had so many brothers ask, is this Hercules? It's a two different people. Heraclius was a leader, a head, the king of the Byzantines or the Byzantines, the king of the Romans at the time. And he was born approximately five years after the Prophet ﷺ was born. And when the Prophet ﷺ announced his prophethood, Heraclius was almost at the peak of his leadership. And they were, he was, like I said, the head or the leader, the king of the Byzantines who were Romans. And they were known to be Christians. And this individual Heraclius, he was a devout Christian. He knew the scripture. He was extremely knowledgeable, as Abu Sufyan says, extremely knowledgeable. And at the same time, he used to look into the stars. He used to look into the stars. He used to do these astrology things and all these things which we know, obviously, are prohibited in the religion. And one day, where the Romans defeated the Persians, it was an extremely happy time for the Romans. They were rejoicing. So they made their way to Jerusalem to pay tribute and to pay thanks. And when they got to Jerusalem, as we said, they were rejoicing. They were happy. Then one day, he wakes up. This is who Heraclius. He wakes up in a sad mood. So his people, those under him, they tell him, what's wrong? So he says, last night I saw something. Whether it was in the stars, as some said, and, or it was in a dream, as some said. What did he see? He saw that the leader, the leader of the circumcised people will come to prevail. The leader of the circumcised people. So he asked his people, who is it that circumcises themselves? And they said, it is the Jews. The Jews, they circumcise themselves. And then he told them once again exactly what happened. He told them what he saw. And they said, you do not have to worry. For if you would like, you can send out your troops and they will kill every one of them. And that means that this individual who you saw in the stars or in your dream, whatever it was, he can't come to prevail. So then this individual Heraclius, he received a letter. Because at that time, the Prophet wasallam was sending letters to certain rulers, to certain chiefs, leaders, kings, heads. One of the people he sent to was Mokoklis in Egypt, uh, was Caesar. And one of them was Heraclius at the hands with the messenger of Dihya, Dihya al-Kalbi, from the tribe of Banu Kalb. So he sent this letter with Dihya. Dihya gave it to an individual, one of the leaders of Busra, who gave it to Heraclius. And then when he saw the letter, and inshallah next week we're going to see what that letter said exactly. When he saw the letter, he realized that, hold on a second, this individual that I saw, it might not be from the Jews. It might be from the Arabs. So he asked his people, do the Arabs circumcise themselves? They said yes. And then he realized, you know, what's going on. So he ordered his people, go out and search for someone out there in Asham. And Asham back then wasn't the way we think of it today, just Syria, for example. Asham was included Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, even some parts, as some scholars, they said, of Turkey, some parts of Turkey. So he said, turn the face upside down. Turn the face, yani, of Sham upside down until you find someone who knows something detailed about this individual. 
So then his delegates, his people, they went away and they started searching and searching and searching. And there was a treaty which occurred, a peace treaty, an agreement, if you'd like to say, known as the Treaty of Hudaybiyah or Hudaybiyah, Sulh al Hudaybiyah, that occurred six years after the Hijrah. Six years after the Hijrah. Abu Sufyan at that time was practically the leader or the head of Quraysh. But about five years ago, or four years ago, during the Battle of Badr, which occurred two years after the Hijrah, he didn't even participate in it. He wasn't as known at that time. But during the Battle of Badr, so many of the heads of Quraysh were killed, that Abu Sufyan slowly came to rise, to the extent he led them in the third year in the Battle of Uhud, and then the fifth year in the Battle of the Trench, and then in the sixth year, in the sixth year, the Kafar, they had an agreement with the Muslims. And the story is very long, but to summarize it, it was an agreement. And it was for 10 years. They said, 10 years, we are allowed to come into Mecca and do whatever we need to do. You're allowed to cross to go to wherever you need to go. So at this point, Abu Sufyan, slightly after the peace treaty in the sixth year of Hijra, he traveled to Asham to trade. Now he can trade freely. So he was in Asham with some of his people. And one narration mentions 30 people, 30 people going to trade. So when he went to Asham, all of a sudden he was in Gaza. And then the troops of this Heraclius came and they saw them and they knew they were Arabs. And after speaking to them, they ordered that they be taken to the kingdom of Heraclius, to the courts of Heraclius. And that's when the story starts. That's when the story starts. So the hadith starts by saying, دَعَاهُمْ فِي مَجْلِسِهِ That he called them to come to their courts. وَحَوْلَهُ عُظَمَاءُ الرُّومِ And around Heraclius, when they walked in, were the heavies of the heavy in our day and age. We all know the word heavy. Around Heraclius, when Abu Sufyan and his 29 or 30 people with him, they walked into the courts. There was Heraclius, in one narration mentions wearing a crown and around him were all the uh, seniors, if you'd like to say, of Rome. The priests, whatever you'd like to say, the bishops, the heavies of the heavy. So they walked in and then Heraclius, he continues and he says, or the hadith says, Thumma da'ahum. And then he called them again. So the first time he called them, he said, come into the courts. The second time he called them, it was to bring them closer. It was to bring them closer. And then he called for his translator, for his interpreter, because Heraclius couldn't speak Arabic. He couldn't speak Arabic. So Heraclius said to his translator to tell them, which of you is closest in lineage to this man who claims, who alleges, who claims that he is a prophet? Who is closest to them? Now Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, he was the leader at the time, obviously, as we said. So he was the head of these 30 people. But on top of that, he was also the closest to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So when the translator translated this, and as we said, Heraclius wasn't a stupid man. He wasn't an idiot, if you'd like to say. He wasn't on the other side of our intelligence. He was a very, very, very intelligent man. And every single question which he asked in this sitting, it had a purpose. And next week, inshallah, we're going to explain all the purposes, the reasons behind these delicate questions. So he says, أَيُّكُمْ أَقْرَبُ نَسَبًا إِلَى هَذَا الرَّجُلِ الَّذِي يَزْعُمُ أَنَّهُ So Abu Fusufyan says, أَنَا قُلْتُ أَنَا أَقْرَبُهُمْ نَسَبًا I said, I am the closest to يعني, this man who was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in regards to lineage, in regards to lineage. And why did Heraclius specifically ask this? Because he wanted someone, one who would not just say anything about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another individual, if Heraclius asked him what he asked, and we're going to see the first question revolved around lineage, family. So any other person, maybe they'll just throw out a word or words, they wouldn't care what they're saying. But someone who's close to him, they'll be very careful how they talk about the lineage. Because if they speak about his lineage, it's going to go back to their lineage. It all goes back to the same root. It all goes back to the same root. And secondly, who knows someone better than their own family? 
Who knows someone better than the closest to him? So Abu Sufyan said, I am. I am the closest to him. We said it was collected 12 times in Sahih al-Bukhari. In one narration, it's mentioned that Heraclius asked him, asked Abu Sufyan, what's your relation to him? So he said, I'm his cousin. I'm his cousin. Because we have Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the son of Abdullah. He is the son of Abdul Muttalib. He is the son of Hashim. He is the son of Abd Manaf. That's the lineage. Abd Muhammad, Ibn Abdullah, Ibn Abdul Muttalib, Ibn Hashim, Ibn Abd Manaf. His fourth grandfather, his name was Abd Manaf. Then you have Abu Sufyan. And Abu Sufyan's name was Sakhr. So you have Abu Sufyan, the son of Harb, the son of Umayya, the son of Abd Shams, the son of Abd Manaf. So Hashim and Abd Manaf and Abd Shams were brothers. Their father was one, Abd Manaf. And this was the lineage. Uh, this is how they connected in lineage. This is how they connected in lineage. So then Heraclius knew, Khalas, this individual is the closest to him out of all these people. So he says, فَأَدْنُوهُ He tells his people, Heraclius, he tells his troops, his soldiers. He says, فَأَدْنُوهُ minni, Bring him closer to me. وَقَرِّبُوا أَصْحَابَهُ وَجْعَلُوهُمْ وَرَاءَ ظَهْرِهِ He's a very intelligent man. He says, bring him closer to me and get his companions close to me and place him behind his back. So all the 29 or 30 men, place them behind Abu Sufyan. But why? Because the questions he's about to ask are very serious questions. Are very serious questions. So he tells his translator the reason. He tells his translator the reason. Look how يعني, intelligent he was, Heraclius. He says to his translator, tell them, tell these individuals that I am going to ask this man a question فَإِنْ كَذَبَنِي فَكَذِّبُوهُ If he lies to me about something, then belie him. Do something. Say something. Make a movement. Make a gesture to say that he's lying to me. Why? Because if they were all on the same line, or if they were all in each other's sights, this is Abu Sufyan, it's their leader. It's their leader, the leader of the 29 or 30. So imagine someone saying, yeah, he's a liar. How are you going to go back with Abu Sufyan and you're one of these 29 men and said he's a liar? Impossible. Impossible. You're never, he's never going to look at you the same. So he said, bring him closer to me and bring his people closer, but place them behind him. And he told his translator, tell them, إِنِّي سَائِلٌ هَذَا الرَّجُلْ أَسْئِلَهُ فَإِنْ كَذَبَنِي فَكَذِّبُهُ I'm going to ask this man some questions. If he lies to me, then belie him. Make it known that he's lying. So then... Abu Sufyan was standing in front of Heraclius. And this isn't a fairy tale, brothers. This is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in the most authentic book, most authentic book on the face of this earth after the Quran, Sahih al-Bukhari. This is something that 100% the Muslims know and believe that this happened. Can you imagine someone from Quraysh, a group from Mecca, standing in Jerusalem, in front of a Roman king, the king of the Byzantines, the Roman emperor, and he's about to interrogate him. He's about to interrogate him about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he says, like we said, bring him closer, put the people behind him. I'm going to ask him questions. If he lies to me, make sure you uh, belie him. So he says, قال Abu Sufyan, this is Abu Sufyan saying now, after this individual Heraclius placed him in front. He says, فَوَاللَّهِ لَوْلَ الْحَيَاءِ لَوْلَ الْحَيَاءِ مِنْ أَنْ يَأْثِرُ عَلَيَّ كَذِبًا لَكَذَبْتُ عَلَى النَّبِي or لَكَذَبْتُ عَلَيْهِ مِنِي عَلَى النَّبِي That by Allah, if it wasn't out of my shyness, my embarrassment, my modesty, my fear, that these people, meaning my own people, would say that I am a liar, I would have lied about this individual who was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These are kafar at the time, disbelievers. And look how staunch they were that they do not utter a single lie. Lying to them, even at that time, even to the non-believers, lying to them was something massive. It wasn't a joke. Wallahi, some tribes, they would prefer death, death, than for it to be known that they said one single lie. 
So he says, if it wasn't out of fear that these, my companions, would say one day that I'm a liar, that I lied, even that one instance, I would have lied about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about this man. And he says in another narration, and I knew that even if I lied, even if I lied, they weren't going to uh, gesture. These are my people. We all know how tribal uh, the Arabs were at those times. Even today, يعني, you see it. You see it today. If you've got a brother in the same country when you're overseas together, خلص, you automatically got a bit of that uh, uh, connection. Then if he's from the same city, you've got a bit of that connection even more. Then if he's from the same area, or he attends the same masjid as you, naturally, you've got a bit of that connection. But back then, it was to a whole other level. They were extremely tribal, extremely tribal. So subhanAllah, this is Abu Sufyan saying, I know that they're not going to gesture. Even if I told a thousand lies, I know they're not going to say anything. But because of his modesty in front of them, being especially the leader, he says, if I did not fear that these individuals one day would say that he lied, he lied, then I would have told that lie. So how many of us today, brothers, you know, when we go through these uh, stories, when we go through these talks, when we go through, etc., these ahadith or these ayat in the Qur'an, we need to take lessons from them that we can implement. This is a non-believer and he cares that much about not saying a single lie. So what about us in our day and age today as Muslims? How many people do we know that, wallahi, they lie more than they tell the truth? More than they tell the truth. And the hadith says, beware, or the hadith says, stick to the truth. Stick to saying the truth. For truthfulness leads to paradise. Or truthfulness leads to piety. And piety leads to paradise. And an individual, a person, he will continue to say the truth. And he will continue to try to say the truth and find the truth. So much so that to Allah Azza wa Jal, he will be written from amongst the truthful. And you imagine to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're known as someone who's truthful. And then the end of the hadith is the opposite. And beware of falsehood. Beware of lying. For lying leads to wickedness. And wickedness leads to the fire. And a man will continue to lie. And he will continue to endeavor to tell lies. He will continue to try hard to tell lies. Until he will be written with Allah Azza wa Jal as a liar. As a liar. Or nahwa ma qala nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they were very scared of telling this lie or telling a lie. And in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was asked, Can a Muslim or a believer be a coward? Can he be a coward? He said, yes. This is the Prophet ﷺ saying, yes. It was said to him a second time now, Can a believer be stingy? Can a believer be stingy? فَقَالَ نَعَمْ He said yes. فَقِيلَ لَهُ أَيَكُونُ الْمُؤْمِنُ كَذَّابًا فَقَالَ لَا It was said to him, again, the third question, Can a believer be a liar? He said no. He said no. And we all know the hadith even when it comes to saying that, uh, joking when lying, woe to he who uh, lies to make the people laugh, woe to him, woe to him, etc. Yani, we need to be very, very careful when it comes to uh, these topics, brothers, of lying, etc., etc. Islam calls uh, for good manners, etiquettes. And from the etiquettes with Allah Azza wa Jal is that you do not lie. And from the etiquettes with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and with the Muslims and with yourself is that you do not lie. You do not commit this, this uh, sin. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullaha wa kunu ma'as sadiqeen. O you who believe, fear Allah and be with the truthful. Be amongst the truthful. And the hadith continues then. Qila, and the hadith continues, sorry. And this is when the interrogation really starts. And inshallah, I'm not going to go through uh, the actual questions too much today. Probably another 15 minutes, we'll go through the 10. We'll see what Heraclius actually asked the Prophet Sallallahu uh, the, the Abu Sufyan about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And next week, inshallah, we'll finish off the narration and we'll speak about why Heraclius chose these questions. He didn't just say anything and throw any words and say whatever. He picked certain questions. Remember, he had knowledge of the scripture. He was a Christian. He knew his religion. 
He knew what he was going to ask and what he needed to ask to tell whether the Prophet ﷺ was in fact real, meaning a real, a true Prophet, or whether he was not. So when he called for Abu Sufyan to come closer, put those people behind him, etc., like we said, he asked the first question. Ala kayfa nasabuhu fikum? Kayfa nasabuhu fikum? Ten questions, ten questions that he asked Abu Sufyan, and the first question he asked was, how is his lineage amongst you? How is his lineage amongst you? So Abu Sufyan said, huwa fina dhu nasab. He can't lie now. He can't lie. He said he is amongst us someone of a noble lineage. Someone of a noble lineage. And the prophets, as we know, they used to get sent in noble lineages. No one can criticize their lineage. Even the wives of the prophet or prophets, for example, Lut alayhi salam and Nuh alayhi salam, even though they disbelieved, they would never, ever, ever, as the scholars, they say, for example, do something that would threaten the lineage of a prophet like commit zina and the likes. So he says, Huwa fina dhu nasab. He is amongst us a person of high lineage, an honorable lineage. So then, and like we said, lineage to them was extremely important to the extent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as Al-Bara ibn Azib, he says, uh, which is also collected in Al-Bukhari, when he was asked, Al-Bara ibn Azib, did anyone amongst you flee, run away during the battle of Hunayn? Did anyone run away? He said, by Allah, no one ran away. And then he said some things about the young ones from amongst the companions. But then towards the end of the hadith, he says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was on his mount, his beast, whatever he was riding. And then he came down. Then he came off of his beast. And he made dua to Allah Azza wa Jal to give them victory. And then at the end of it, he looked and he said, at the end of his dua, after he made dua, he looked and he said, that I am, I am a prophet, there is no lie. I am a prophet, there is no lie, meaning no lie to it. And then he said, Ana ibn Abdul Muttalib. Ana nabiyu la kathib. Ana ibn Abdul Muttalib. I am the prophet, there is no lie. I am the son of, of Abdul Muttalib. Why? Because Abdul Muttalib was known to be one of the respected and honored heads, heads in Mecca. So then the first question, how is his lineage amongst you? Abu Sufyan responded and he said he is from a noble lineage amongst us. And then the second question, the second question comes and he says, فَهَلْ قَالَ هَذَا الْقَوْلُ أَحَدٌ مِنْكُمْ قَطُّ قَبْلَهُ فَقُلْتُ لَا Heraclius asked, obviously the translator, to tell him, did anyone from amongst you, whether he meant Quraysh or the Arabs, Wallahu a'lam, but did anyone amongst you say the Arabs? Has anyone before him claimed to be a prophet? So Abu Sufyan said, no. No, يعني, no one amongst us claimed to be a prophet. And remember, brothers, there's a reason behind every single question. Next week, Wallahi, is so important. So, so important. Because we're going to learn about the reasons why Heraclius picked these questions. So he says, has anyone before you, say the Arabs, claimed to be a prophet? He said no. Abu Sufyan said no. Then the third question. Allah, Heraclius said, فَهَلْ كَانَ مِنْ آبَائِهِ مِنْ مَلِكِ أَوْ فَهَلْ كَانَ مِنْ آبَائِهِ مَنْ مَلَكِ Is there from his forefathers a king or someone who possessed, which is the same meaning basically, a king or someone who possessed yani kingship or a kingdom? فَقُلْتُ لَا So no, I said no to him. There was no one, yani meaning there was no one from amongst his ancestors that possessed this kingship or was a king. Then the third question, قَالَ فَأَشْرَافُ النَّاسِ يَتَّبِعُونَهُ أَمْ دُعَفَاؤُهُمْ Then Heraclius asked, is it the honorable, the noble from amongst the people that follow him? Or is it the poor and the weak? Is it the poor? So, قُلْتُ بَلْ دُعَفَاؤُهُمْ Abu Sufyan said, verily the, 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 the poor ones, the weak ones, they are the ones that follow him. Then he said, قَالَ أَيَزِيدُونَ أَمْ يَنْقُصُونَ Do they increase or do they decrease? These people يعني, that follow him, are they increasing or are they decreasing? 
قلت بل يزيدون so I said rather they're increasing قال فهل يقدر uh, he asked this is Abu Su uh, Heraclius the next question does he break his promise this individual you're saying or this individual that now I'm interrogating you about the one that claims alleges he's a prophet does he break his promises then Abu Sufyan said no he does not break his promises and then he continues to say however however we are now in a peace treaty with him فَمَا أَدْرِي مَاذَا سَيَفْعَلُوا بَعْد He says, so I am now, we're in a peace treaty. What peace treaty? The one we just said in the sixth year of Hijrah, Sulh uh, al-Hudaybiyah. The peace treaty that, you know, we're, we're allowed to enter Mecca freely. No one can say anything to us. You're allowed to pass by whatever you want from Medina to get to wherever you want for trading, etc., etc. So Abu Sufyan, he responds by saying no. Then he says, so after he said, فَالْيَغْدِرْ قُلْتُ لَا وَنَحْنُ مِنْهُ فِي مُدَّةٍ لَا نَعْرِفُ أَوْ لَا نَدْرِ مَا هُوَ فَاعِلٌ فِيهَا Abu Sufyan says, no, but we're now in a time where we have a peace treaty. We have this treaty. So we do not know what he's going to do. So Abu Sufyan, he says, because Abu Sufyan became a Muslim shortly after. He became a Muslim. And when he became this Muslim, he's the one that narrated this hadith. So he says, I said, no, but we're in a peace treaty right now and I do not know what he's going to do. Is he going to break the promise? Is he not? Is he going to do something to break this treaty? Is he not? I don't know. And Abu Sufyan says, I was not able to throw something in there, to throw something to Yani, be a bit, uh, to degrade the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a little bit, except this word. Except this word. And even then it wasn't accepted by Heraclius. Uh, so I was not able to, basically, as we know it, brothers, I wasn't able to throw a jab at him, except this uh, statement that I said. Except this statement that I said. So then Heraclius continues to ask, and he says, قَالَ فَهَلْ يَرْتَدُّ أَحَدٌ مِّنْهُمْ سَخْتَةً لِدِينِهِ بَعْدَ أَنْ يَدْخُلَ فِيهِ So now Heraclius says, does anyone leave the religion, يعني the religion of Islam, his religion, uh, out of displeasure because of it, yani being displeased because of it after they entered Islam, فَقُلْتُ لَا I said no. Yani no one leaves the religion. No one leaves the religion due to being displeased with the religion after they enter it. Then he says, فَهَلْ كُنْتُمْ تَتَّهِمُونَهُ بِالْكَذِبِ قَبْلَهِ He says, did you used to state or claim, did you used to allege uh, that he's a liar or that he lies before this, يعني before he said he's a prophet, فَقُلْتُ لَا I said no. And inshallah next week we're going to speak about this a little bit. A little bit. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, obviously as we all know, he caught to truth. He caught to speaking the truth. He obviously spoke the truth to the extent in Mecca he was known as the truthful one. He was known. You know, when Tabbat Yada Abi Lahab bin Watab came down, Surah Al-Masad, when this verse came down, the reason for the verse coming down, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he got uh, verses revealed to him. وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ And warn, warn your tribe from your kinsmen, your nearest kin. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to follow this verse, to implement, to act upon this verse, he went to the mountain of Safa. And he went to the top of the mountain and he started to call a call which basically alerts the people. So he says, Ya Sabaha! Ya Sabaha! He starts calling the people, alerting the people. The people would say, Man hadha alladhi yahtif? Who is this who is calling? And they would say, Muhammad. So they would go to him. And the hadith, some of them they say, pertaining to this, that if we were not able to go, we would send someone to go on our behalfs to see what's going on. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would call the people by the tribes. Ya Bani Abd Manaf, Ya Bani Abd Shams, Ya Bani Fihr, Ya Bani Adi, etc, etc, etc. Ya Bani Fulan, Ya Bani Fulan, Ya Bani Fulan. O tribe of so-and-so, O tribe of so-and-so, O tribe of so-and-so, O tribe of so-and-so. Gather, gather. And then he says, what would you say? What would you say if I told you that there is يعني, people 
behind this valley waiting to come and attack you. Would you believe me? They say, yes, naam. Ma jarrabna alayka kathiba. Ma jarrabna alayka kathiba. We've never seen a lie from you. And that's when he said, I warn you of a painful or severe torment uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the meaning. And then Abu Lahab stood and he said, Tabban lak. May you perish or woe to you. Tabban lak sa'ir al-qawm alihadha jama'atana. Woe to you. Is it for this that you gathered us? Is this why يعني, you made all this fuss and this ruckus and this call? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down once again from above the heavens, Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab. So subhanallah, subhanallah, Allah azza wa jal revealed these verses 10 years before the death of Abu Lahab. 10 years before the death of Abu Lahab. Like all he had to do was say, La ilaha illallah as a munafiq, as a hypocrite. And khalas, he's belied the message basically. But impossible. Ten years. He had ten years to say, La ilaha illallah. Even if he didn't mean it. Even if he was a hypocrite. Even if in his heart he still hated Islam, which he did. Which he did. All he had to do was say, La ilaha illallah. He had ten years, but he never said it. So the moral of the story to the Meccans and to the world in reality, he was known as a truthful one to this extent. If I were to tell you that there is a people waiting to attack you behind this valley, they're behind the valley, they're waiting to attack, would you believe me? They said, yes, we will believe you. But of course, many belied uh, the message. So he said, did you used to allege that he lies or he's a liar or he's lied before he said what he said, that he's a prophet? So I said, no. So Heraclius said, does he break his promises? And we spoke about that. Then he says, So then Heraclius asked, obviously the translator once again to ask Abu Sufyan, did you fight him? Did you fight this individual? I said yes. How was your fighting? How did it happen? So Abu Sufyan says, That the war between us was sijal, basically in turns. In turns. Sometimes we would be victorious over him, and sometimes he and they would be victorious over us. Over? Us. And then he asks the last question, Bima ya'murukum? Bima ya'murukum? What does he command you with? What does he order you to do? And inshallah, next week we've got a lot to speak about with this narration. So he says, Qala bima ya'murukum? What, is it, what does he call you to do? So Abu Sufyan says, Ya'muruna, he commands us, Alla na'buda illa Allah, or u'budullah wahdah, that we worship Allah as one God. And do not ascribe any partners with him. And do not ascribe any partners with him. So the first thing he orders us with is Tawheed. And leave off that which your forefathers used to command with. And he commands us. So after the Tawheed, after the Tawheed and staying away from shirk and taghut and the likes. And after leaving off what our forefathers would tell us. He says, He commands us with prayer and truthfulness to be truth in our words and our actions. And to remain chaste. To remain chaste. And to maintain the ties of uh, kinship. And inshallah ta'ala, next week we're going to go through this uh, in a little bit more detail. And we're going to speak about each question in a bit more detail. And why Heraclius decided to specifically ask these questions. And we're going to spend a bit of time inshallah discussing these things that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded them with. Wallahu a'la wa a'lam. Wa salli lahumma wa sallim wa barik ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man. Allahi kam tastatib bul quruh wa yabra'u jurhul kasir al-jarih 
وينشط ذاك السقيم العليل وقد كان بالسقم دهر